Amen. You may be seated. It's good to see everyone. My name is Matt, and um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here with us online. If you were trying to watch it or join us at nine, we had trouble, so thanks for coming back. And I'm going to grab this TV real quick, real smooth, smooth like. We had all kinds of problems first service, and amazingly, uh, Wes Atkins and Jeremy got it figured out, so we're back in business. So, all right. Well, we are going through some different psalms, if you've been here the last several weeks, and there is a whole category of psalm that we have not yet covered, and um, we haven't talked about it. It's a huge chunk of the psalms, and it's the psalms of thanksgiving or the psalms of praise. And essentially, they're, they're songs, right, of, of worship. And so these are the psalms that people think of typically when we think of the psalms. And so I want to look at one of them. If you go to the next slide, uh, Psalm 95. There we go. Now it's working. And there are dozens that are like this. And what I want to explore this morning is what do the psalms teach us about worship? Now, worship is one of those words that brings to mind really different things for different people, kind of depending on our background or maybe church experience or not or perspective or personality. Um, We think of different images, different ideas, different emotions. Maybe for a lot of us here, and this could be most of us, when we hear the word worship, what does your mind immediately think? Music. In a lot of churches like ours, we think of the two, three, or four songs we sing, you know, before the message, or maybe a song after the message, or maybe when you hear worship, you think of a particular, you know, like Hillsong or Bethel, or whatever worship album that you're into. Um, I would contend that when we think of a style of music, that that's actually a fairly narrow definition of worship. And we say things like, oh, I I like the worship today. Or, "Ah, I didn't really like the worship so much. I didn't, you know, I didn't get that or whatever. So, I want to begin with this confession. Um, I get a little bit nervous whenever people up front talk about worship because I think, all right, let's get to the part where you tell me I'm not doing it right, or I'm not doing what you, apparently what you want to see me doing. Um, So I I have some baggage, so I'm saying. So I'm not going to do that, but I do hope to challenge us. I do hope to, from this psalm, maybe broaden or deepen our picture of what worship even is, and um, to do so in a way that I hope is encouraging. Now, here is kind of part of where I'm coming from. This will be helpful context, I think. If we just kind of take a step back, if you think about Christians, all around the world right now, here's, here's one observation, uh, roughly one half of them, or 1.2 billion, are Roman Catholic. And their worship looks nothing virtually like ours. In fact, unless you've grown up Catholic, you might not even know what is going on. And one of my questions is, without subs, how do you feel God's presence? Huh? Okay, too Too far. I see. First service, they like that. They kind of laugh. This, I don't know. Um, Obviously, though, a really big emphasis here on, like, the sacraments and on tradition. Um, Another really significant percentage of global Christians would be those of Eastern or Greek Orthodox. And again, if you or I went to one of these masses or services, you wouldn't go away going, I didn't really like the music, or I didn't really get much out of that message, you go, what the heck just happened, okay? So very, very different from our kind of idea of worship. A uh, a third category, a growing percentage, especially in like the majority world countries, places like Central and South America, Asia, Southeast Asia, a growing and increasingly large percentage of believers in those places are Pentecostal or some, you know, charismatic. And a lot of us would, frankly, not want to stand for that long, okay? Now, that, just those categories alone, what that does, that leaves us with less than 
less than 25% of the pie for all the rest, all the other denominations and, and approaches and styles. Of those, a large chunk are mainline. You could think of Methodist or Presbyterian, uh, Episcopalian, Lutheran, where a lot more weight is given to a sacrament, but also liturgy and the church calendar. Um, and then there's the Anabaptist stream, the Mennonites, the Friends. Um, here's a group of Quakers in that stream, and it's obviously quite a rowdy bunch, you can see. And by the way, we'll get back to this, but they're, the way that they're sitting actually reflects a deep belief that they have about what worship is. Um, in our own community, and really in most cities across America, there are several African-American churches whose worship is much more energetic, amen, is much more expressive, right, with, you know, praise and uh, gospel choirs and praise teams. And, you know, what's interesting is that we, most of us, wouldn't know any of the songs that they, that they sing. Um, and we'd find it to be way too long. Some of us would leave and we'd go, I've never felt more uncomfortable in my life, and, oddly, I've never felt more welcome in my life. So all that to say, we're just talking globally, and even across the American Christian landscape, uh, when, we come, when we think of this kind of modern, contemporary worship, right, where you come in hour, hour and 15 minutes, it's punctual but casual, uh, where low on liturgy, it's two-part service, singing and sermon, you know, the, 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 you know, right? Um, what I'm trying to say is that that is a much smaller piece of the whole than what we might think. Again, we're just talking globally. This is not for the faint of heart, but if you dare to think about this, you know what I do though with this? I go, <laughs> well, obviously everyone else has it wrong. That's where mine go my mind goes. Okay. If you were to actually think about this historically and not just right now around the world, if you were to factor in, I don't know, the last 2,000 years of church history and what worship has looked like through the centuries, like on a timeline, guess where we are? Well, we're at this end, right? And we're just like a little tiny, tiny dot. Let me put this line up. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see that line? That represents... The, roughly the 1970s, okay, with the, the birth of like the Jesus movement where um, things got more casual, right? And that was coming out of the 1960s, so it was a reaction like to a broader counter-cultural movement. And you have the Jesus movement, you have the charismatic stream where worship becomes a little more informal. And there was a move in these circles away from hymns. Is anybody alive during this time, right? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm not singling anybody out. Uh, a move from hymns, like singing about God, the hymns that, you know, your grandparents, to, in many circles, these first-person praise choruses, guitar, you know, and drums later on. I can still hear my grandparents saying, like, why do we have to say the same thing over and over and over? Like, I, I sung it or however you say that. So anyway, um, and then, by the way, the most kind of recent iterations of this and where we are, um, it's made possible, really, by technology, which is fairly new. Screens and projectors and the internet and changes in church architecture to a, a big stage or platform area or whatever. And finally, with no small amount of credit due to secular bands like U2, where we got all of our guitar parts from. Cliff, I, I told Cliff explicitly he's exempt from that particular indictment. Uh, anyway, one way that you could interpret this, and also this, is that we have finally got worship right. <laughs> Isn't that great? Or... A slightly more humble approach would be to say, I wonder if this is bigger than I thought. What if it's more than personal preference and what I get out of it? Because here, here's what, where my mind goes. 
if you're anything like me, I would hate for my picture, my practice of worship to basically dismiss like 80% of Christians in the world right now. That seems kind of odd, right? Even worse, what a shame if my understanding of worship alienates 98% of Christians in the last 2,000 years. Something, to me at least, doesn't seem quite right about that. Uh, I heard a story of a boy who asked his grandfather, who was a retired priest, what is worship? And this man had been, you know, he's in his 80s, he'd been a clergyman his whole life, and he recognized it's hard to put into words that definition. Kind of like us, you take a breath 10,000 times a day, but if you had to explain to like a medical student what breathing is or why it's important, and he came to this place where he realized I've been teaching people, I've been leading people into this my whole life, and yet it's more of a mystery than ever before. So Psalm 95, I think, captures this mystery. I think it expands our definition of what worship even is. And most importantly, he's inviting us into worshiping uh, together. So Psalm, David begins, Psalm 95, verse 1. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. So the psalmist is not addressing God directly, but the psalmist is inviting us to join the poet in praising God together. Next verse, here's why. Verse 3, 4, the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. Meaning when you discover who God is, it's natural then to sing for joy to the Lord, to make a joyous noise. Um, the natural response is to come into God's presence with music and with song. And of course, it's not a surprise that the psalm would mention music because these are songs that you would use in ancient Judaism in the synagogue, in the, in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, we don't have the original music. Like, the tune has been lost, unfortunately, to history. But do you know what I know about this music? That if we had it today, you would probably hate it. Like, our response would be like, oh, I can't worship to this, right? Because it's a different instrumentation, different tonal scale than the 12 notes in our Western context, a different aesthetic. It'd be very strange to most of us. Now, what I want us to see is that music is, yes, one, albeit one important form or expression of worship, but there are other forms. We just kind of have latched on to this one in a lot of places, um, that said, theologian N.T. Wright calls music that most mysterious of all the arts, no offense to the other arts, itself joining heaven and earth. And if you know me, you know I really believe that. There's just something transcendent about music, its ability to express the inexpressible, to capture mystery. I stand by it, try to change my mind. Psalm 95 begins by inviting us to acclaim God and to proclaim God's greatness. N.T. Wright, again, for the win, offers a really helpful definition of worship. This is not flashy, and this is not even that uh, memorable, but I really think this captures it. Worship is about contemplating who God is and what he's done. Standing in awe and expressing that awe and thanks in praise. Who is God, by the way, in Psalm 95? He tells us. God is the great God, the great king above all gods. He's the rock of our salvation. But related to this first part, who is God, there's also the next part. What has this God done? What has he done? And what we find next in Psalm 95, as well as all throughout Jewish and Christian history, is that praise always begins with God as creator. Always starts there. God as creator, of course, is like who God is, but it's also part of what God has done. Look at verse 4. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Now, how many of you here have, like, you've been to the mountains, or you've gotten to go be by the ocean, the sea, 
or somewhere out in nature, and seeing that, there was something in your heart that was stirred to say, maybe not to like, the hills are, maybe you didn't like, maybe you didn't break into spontaneous musical, but you felt something, and you were moved to say, isn't God amazing? And it's so beautiful. Isn't God awesome? That's what he's talking about. And maybe not even some, like, exotic, maybe it was, like, in your garden, or something of ordinary beauty that you noticed on a walk. Yeah, That's why a lot of people say they feel closest to God in nature. There's a reason for that, because you are immersed in God's work. Uh, Psalm 95 is an echo of Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. I heard someone say once that it's, it's not that it's our world with God's fingerprint, fingerprints occasionally here and there if you look really hard. No, no, no. It's God's world and our fingerprints just so happen to be all over the place. The point is that our ordinary experiences of beauty in creation, that's actually meant to be a starting point. It's meant to be a clue that causes us to glimpse and then be overwhelmed by and then ultimately move to worship the beauty of God himself. Does that make sense? Uh, I love the poem by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. She says, the earth is crammed with heaven. Every bush is ablaze with the glory of God. Those who see take off their shoes. That's good, huh? Uh, Johann Kepler, who was the 16th century German astronomer. Uh, he's famous for articulating the laws of planetary motion. Uh, the psalm the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God, right? Uh, in fact, Isaac Newton used his work as a platform to eventually um, ex- articulate his uh, laws of, of gravity, theory of gravity. Anyway, Kepler wrote one day, after making a particular discovery, he said, I was merely thinking God's thoughts after him. Yeah. This means that every step in scientific discovery is supposed to add to this chorus of praise instead of what often happens is to be used as like, oh, see why that's why God doesn't exist or whatever. The natural world around us, which science investigates and represents, actually has this capacity to point to the glory of God who created it. I mean, the psalmist is insisting that unspoken truth is everywhere spoken everywhere, that God's presence permeates the world around us. Now, did you know that that in and of itself would be enough to call us to worship? This by itself should be enough to make us go, wow, God is amazing. Thank you. We praise him as Lord and creator. But David gives us another reason. In verse 6, he says, come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. As always in scripture, contemplating God as creator leads us to this moment of awe where we recognize this God isn't just God or the God. This is what? He is uh, he's our, he's our God. We are his people. I mean, the the story of scripture is that God had chosen Israel. And the the end of the story, the, the middle part, is that we who believe in Jesus, we who believe in him, are part of that same story. We can make the same claim that we are his people, the people of his pasture and the sheep under his care. If you're here last week, we talked about this imagery, same thing, the Lord is my shepherd from the 23rd Psalm. The idea that in the Middle East, To this day, there is a unique bond between shepherd and sheep. It's close. It's a warm relationship, and that's how it's meant to be with God and his people. So worship is not just music. It's knowing and loving God for who God is, being satisfied with God. So again, our our worship starts with contemplating who God is and what he's done, and of course, as Jesus' followers, we remember that in Jesus we're redeemed, we're forgiven, we're reconciled, we're sons and daughters of God. I mean, you find the writers of the New Testament over and over trying to put this into words. 
And so you have Paul saying, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Or here's John's attempt. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Do you see his excitement in that statement? And that is what we are. See, the more that we get in touch with that reality, the more our contemplation moves us to awe, that he is our God. And the more that then overflows with with thanksgiving and praise. It's that line that we sing from the hymn around here once in a while. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. How great thou art. How great thou art. When we reflect on who God is and what he's done, it ultimately moves us not just to awe, but to expressing that awe to him. And we have moments when we're aware of who God is and what God has done, and the praise maybe comes a little bit more naturally. But then we have other times where we forget or we're distracted or we have other things on our mind, and we need to be reminded. We need to be refocused. It's in those moments we actually need to proclaim what we already know. And it's often in the proclaiming that the praise and the gratitude wells up. Just like everything important in life, it doesn't start with momentum. Do you know what momentum does? Momentum says, you go first and I'll follow. The same with this. So what I'm trying to say, and I hope you're, you're hearing me say this, worship isn't really about us at all. Yeah, it's, it's our response, but we are not the object, the direction of worship. Can you see how, with all of this in mind, how it, it doesn't quite make sense to say, I didn't really like that worship. What? We have preferences. We might not have liked the music or the presentation or whatever, the sermon, right? But to say, I, it's not for me to begin with. If the point is who God is and what God has done and that that deserves a response on my part, it's not really what I feel. By the way, you know who understands this? Nature. The psalmist says the trees clap their hands in praise. The mountains sing for joy. Jesus says at one point, if if you don't praise, if you don't acknowledge who he is, guess what? The rocks will cry out on your behalf. And that's not just like a, oh, that's neat. That's like a, you weren't doing, I wasn't doing my job. It's an indictment. Worship is more than just music. Here's why. Suddenly, Matthew 28, the risen Jesus met them, the disciples. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. That doesn't mean they, they pulled out guitars. Lord, I lift your name. You know what that does mean? We see who you are. We understand what you have done. Our lives, as a response, are yours. You're the one. You're the king. You're Lord. And so we worship also by reading scripture, which is remembering and retelling who God is and what God has done. We do this with creeds. We do this with studying scripture like we're doing right now. We give back to God in our offering. Do you see how giving is part of worship in response to who God is and what he's done? What that also means is that we could have no music ever again, which would be a shame, but we would still could and should be able to say, I worshiped God with all my heart. It means that I should be able to gather with fellow believers here or here or here or way out here 
or here, or even here, and say, I worshiped God. I remembered and celebrated who he is and what he's done for me. Listen, styles, format, uh, preferences, all that changes over time. It varies from culture to culture, from person to person. Our current styles will change. I mean, you realize, take John and Charles Wesley, the great hymn writers, among other things, from the 1700s. They took popular bar tunes and they put like gospel words to them. And I'm just telling you, they wrote some real bangers in their day. Many of them we would find today as unbearable as the original tune to Psalm 95 because things change. Different things speak to different kinds of people, etc. The good news is, the good news is transcultural, meaning it spans time and place and culture and the Holy Spirit is not limited to a particular people or style or technology or whatever it might be. So, Here's what all this does for me. One of the things this does is a broader understanding of worship actually helps me have a better appreciation for other, other people, other believers and traditions and their expressions. For me, I actually find in most, in most, the vast majority of denominations and traditions, something that actually challenges me. So I'm reminded, if you can see this, in our... Catholic or more traditional liturgical brothers and sisters. Um, this tradition reminds me that God is more than just like my buddy. That God is the transcendent king of the universe. You, you see what their architecture is trying to do? It's trying to do the same thing that like when you go out and you look at the stars and the heavens declare the glory of God. This is the king of kings. We are worshiping. And so there's a sense of like awe and reverence, right? There's an, I think, appropriate sense of like, I'm teeny tiny. I'm small in a good way. And yet God, in his great love, has redeemed me. And so this tradition teaches me, I wonder if I need to have more awe, more reverence in my worship. I think of our African-American brothers and sisters worshiping joyfully, exuberantly, often loudly, who are like alive when they worship, who understand that the good news is not, hey, a party of four, your table's not ready. Oh, that was earlier. No, that's great. The good news, though, is that Jesus has risen from the dead. And he's given us this day, and I have a body that I can move, and I have breath in my lungs, which means I can sing, and I can praise him. And so perhaps there are times when worship, my worship, needs to have more energy and vitality and excitement. I think of my Quaker brothers and sisters, and again, they're in a circle because they really actually believe in something scripture calls the priesthood of all believers, that there is no hierarchy. You can see there's no special architecture, really, or furniture, or costumes, or music. They have gathered, and by the way, can you tell what they're doing? I don't know if you can see that. Heads bowed in prayer, likely in a listening moment. They actually believe the Spirit of God is given to all believers and that if we are quiet for a moment, we can actually hear him speak. And so they, (laughs) that's crazy, right? They make time to do that as part of their worship. By the way, they don't celebrate communion or the Lord's Supper on Sundays ever. They wouldn't say it like I just said that. But do you know why that is? Because they take seriously the fact that God by his Spirit is present everywhere. That the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And so there are no secular spaces where God is not. Which means when you as a believer sit down and we enjoy a meal together at the table, we break bread, we are celebrating what? Communion. So why would we do at one point what we're supposed to be doing all the time? And so I take from them, maybe 
I need to be reminded that my worship goes beyond an hour and 15 minutes or an hour on Sunday, right? And maybe I need to make time to listen as well. So I guess here's the question for you guys. Which one's the right way to do it? Right? Yes. By the way, if we had all day, I could do this with every major tradition or stream. But you get the point. All of these can be ways of worshiping because we serve a really big God. And he invites us to worship him in ways that are as varied and diverse as humanity. So, bring him your music. Bring him your shouts of praise and your awed silence. Bring him your dances and your chants and your creeds. Bring him your guitar-driven anthems and your Bach cantatas. Bring him your smoke and your incense and bring him your worship online in your sweatpants. Bring him your well-thought-out liturgies and bring him your tongues of fire. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And if you don't, the rocks will cry out on your behalf. As in, that should have been, that could have been you. And lastly, we know that God actually responds to our worship. Psalm 22 says that God inhabits the praise of his people. That he responds, he reveals himself in his presence, his strengthening, his encouraging. C.S. Lewis says it's in the process of being worshipped that God communicates his presence to men. Because he is our God and we are his people. Amen? I want to invite you to stand and as a benediction, as a final moment of worship together, I'd like us to read something um, out loud. I think it captures a lot of this. And so as our prayer, as our declaration, as our benediction, would you join me? Let's read this together. Let everything that has life, let everything that has breath, give all the glory and honor and praise to the one who overcame death. Let every living thing sing of the mercies of our God. Let us exalt him wherever we live with thanksgiving and joy in our hearts. If we don't praise him, the mountains will. If we don't exalt him, the rocks will cry out in our stead, God is not dead. Let every living thing sing of the mercies of our God. Let us exalt him wherever we live with thanksgiving and joy in our hearts. Amen. Go in a spirit of worship. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.